5, which is number 113 in your hymn book. Then after that, we're going to do, um, we're going to take requests as long as they're reasonable and Christmas music. <laughs> number 113, two verses, the first two verses. We have a request for number 140, which is Once in Royal David City. 140. First true verses. One hundred thirty four. One hundred thirty four, which is joy to the world.
we have another request. 158. Number 158, which is Born in the Night, Mary's Child. Yes. Okay, the pastors are not here yet, so another one? Do we have another request? 129. Lo, how a rose air blooming. Wonderful, 129. Thank you, gathering musicians. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church on this first Sunday after Christmas. We're glad to see all of you here today. If you have not had an opportunity to greet those who are joining you for worship today, maybe not spoken to someone near you, please take the time to greet them and share the peace of Christ with them.
would ask that you would take a friendship register there in the pew and that you would fill it out and pass it to your neighbor so that we can get a record of everyone's attendance today. If you're a first-time visitor, we're delighted to have you worshiping with us, and we would ask that you would take the, fill out the upper portion so that we might get to know you a little better. Dr. and Mrs. Negley are enjoying some time with family today, and so they are not here. Would call your attention to uh, the first hymn. There has been an error there. It's hymn number 132, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. Hymn number 132. We do have, uh, we had this morning uh, an after Christmas breakfast, and we have some people to thank for that. And if you participated in preparing, helping with the breakfast, please stand so that uh, people may recognize you for your efforts. And if you don't want to stand, just raise your hand. <laughs> we thank you for helping us enjoy a time of table fellowship today. We have a number of poinsettias here, and some of you have donated them and have indicated you would like to take them home, and you're invited to do so after today's worship. Poinsettia delivery to shut-ins will begin tomorrow. The pictorial directory uh, is in beginning taking pictures tomorrow. Uh, we will have the photographer here, and we're trying to fill out some spots that are vacant. And uh, the table is at the, in the narthex to make your appointments. I'm getting a little concerned about our Advent devotional for 2016. I know we're still finishing up with the Advent Epiphany devotional for 2015, but um, if you have a toy that you remember having received at Christmas, we'd love for you to contribute a brief paragraph or two about that so that we can compile that Advent devotional for next year. I thank Amy McKee for serving as my liturgist today. And now let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Expecting child, they searched the inn To find a place for you were coming soon There was no room for them to stay So in a manger filled with hay God's only son was born, oh hallelujah The shepherds left their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to you. It was just as the angel said, you'll find him in a manger bed. Emmanuel and Savior, Alleluia. Came to rescue me 
This baby boy would grow to be A man who'd one day die for me and you My sins would drive the nails in you That rugged cross was my cross too Till every breath you drew was alleluia Savior is born. Christ our Savior is born. Please join me in the printed call to worship. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the joy of Christ permeate our entire being and the love of Christ be seen in all we say and do. Let us praise God as we worship Christ our Savior and Lord. no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Please join me in the printed prayer of confession, followed by a time of silent individual confession. Let us pray. O oh God, we do not truly realize what it costs you to leave the realms of heaven and become incarnate in Jesus Christ. And as much as Jesus was fully human, we thank you that he knew what it feels like to be hungry and thirsty, to feel pain and weariness, and to experience disappointments, frustration, and sadness, all feelings to which we can relate. Forgive us when we have taken for granted the love you showed the world. Find Jesus. Friday and Easter. 
Keep us ever mindful that the manger foreshadowed the cross, and that the babe who was born for us also died on the cross for our sins. We praise you for raising Jesus to new life and for your marvelous gift, that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, O God, for loving us so much, and let our gratitude be reflected in our living as we seek to become more like Christ, in whose name we pray. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Every day we have the opportunity to be like the wise men and bring our special gifts before the Lord. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let us present our gifts to the Lord.
us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I would invite the younger disciples to come forward and meet me on the front pew. And as they come, let us join together in singing the third stanza of Away in a Manger. morning. Did you have a nice Christmas? Did you get some nice gifts? Okay, did you eat some nice, wonderful, delicious food? Were you with family and friends? I'd say you had a good Christmas then. Yeah, all the way around. This morning, I wanted to continue something that we've been talking about all month long and even the last Sunday in November, which was the first Sunday of Advent when we lighted the first purple candle. And that was, we talked about the different characters in the nativity set. And on the first, on the first Sunday of Advent, we talked about this character here. Do you know what that character is? No, baby Jesus is down here, but... An angel, that's right. We talked about angels that first time. And then the next week, we talked about this group right over here. Shepherds, that's right. They were the shepherds there. We talked about the shepherds the first Sunday in December. Then the second Sunday in December, we talked about this group over here with these animals here. Do you... Three wise men and the camels, that's correct. And then last Sunday, we talked about this group right here. Three of them, the Holy Family, that's right. And then if you were here on Christmas Eve, what did we talk about above the nativity set? What did we talk about? No, what's that thing right at the top? The star, star, that's right. And so there is a star there. This is a new nativity set that I have. I have wanted one of these for a long time. And this one also has some things in it that you might not normally see. In this one right here, this character right here is a little boy with a dog. And he's blowing a a flute. And then over here we have a shepherdess with a little girl. And I've got a a rooster. So I've got some other characters in there and animals in there. Oh, and there's a goat. And so they, I can add to this, and I look forward to doing it. But I've wanted a nativity set like that for a long time. And what have all of those people and those animals come to do? to see baby Jesus, and what's more, to worship baby Jesus. Now I want to show you another nativity scene that actually was printed in the paper yesterday. I don't know whether any of you saw that, but who is this right here? Santa Claus. And what about this person? The gingerbread man. And what about these? They're elves. What about this one? But it's a particular reindeer. Yes, see that red nose right there? And then do you know who this is? A soldier, a nutcracker. 
And then the last one right here, Frosty the Snowman. And he's holding a giant candy cane. That's right. Now, what do you make of that? Where are their eyes focused? On baby Jesus. On the Holy Family. They're focused on baby Jesus. Bless you. Bless you again. And they're focused on baby Jesus. And I like this particular cartoon because none of these, we would have no Santa Claus, we wouldn't have the gingerbread man, the story of Rudolph or Frosty or the toy soldiers if there had not been first this person right here. All of these are ways that we celebrate Christmas, but we would not have them as part of Christmas if we did not have the child who was born, whose birthday is Christmas, Jesus. And I like it that all of them are focused on him. It reminds us that if we had no Jesus, if we had no Christ, we would have no Christmas. And so it's because of Jesus that we have Christmas and we have all of these stories, these wonderful stories about Santa Claus, the gingerbread man, Frosty, Rudolph, and the uh, wooden soldiers as expressions of love for Christmas, teaching us to love and care for one another. I really like that one, that picture of a nativity, and I like this one, which is new to my home, and I'm very grateful for it. I hope you will remember that. As you think about Christmas, we have a lot of wonderful traditions associated with Christmas, but we wouldn't have any of them if we didn't first have Christ. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and let us talk to God. Oh, Lord, our God, we do give you thanks and praise for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for all the holiday traditions, for all the wonderful stories that teach us about love and caring for one another. We ask that we would truly be loving and caring for one another as we seek to follow more and more closely Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Have a good week and a happy new year to you. Happy new year. Thank you. Let us now come before God's throne of grace to offer our prayers as a people. Almighty God, you wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. In your mercy, let us share the divine life of Jesus Christ who came to share our humanity and who now lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Giver of every perfect gift, how can we begin to thank you for all of the wonderful gifts of this Christmas tide? Long before Christmas arrived, we derived so much joy in making or selecting gifts that would please the recipients, in writing cards and letters to maintain contact with loved ones and friends close by or far away, in decorating our homes and this our home away from home with candles, nativity sets, garlands, wreaths, poinsettias, and trees, in attending concerts or plays to enjoy the holiday music or themes, in baking holiday treats or making favorite foods that family members or guests will enjoy, in showing charity or compassion through anonymous gift giving such as the youth's toy drive or other acts of service, and in dinners, parties, or going caroling, with the arrival of Christmas, we welcome the opportunity to gather for worship on Christmas Eve, to sing the familiar carols, to hear the beloved story, to offer our gifts for medical benevolences, and to see the darkness of the sanctuary dispelled by our candles raised in honor of the one born to be the light of the world. 
Many gave of their time and talents to serve the least of your brothers and sisters at the soup kitchen on Christmas Day and on Boxing Day. We were blessed to enjoy the company of loved ones and friends, perhaps to share a meal and to exchange gifts. As a church family, we are thankful to enjoy an after Christmas breakfast and we appreciate all who prepared to serve us. Most of all, we are grateful for Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, whose birth once again we have celebrated and whose second coming in power and glory we await. Eternal God, the old year of 2015 will soon be history as the new year of 2016 is on the horizon. Forgive our sins of the past, free us from guilt and regret, strengthen us to become the people you would have us to be, inspire us to accomplish even greater things for you and your kingdom in the coming year. Guard all who will be celebrating the new year, shielding them from harm. Restrain those from over-imbibing. Bless those who will be on duty to respond to any emergencies that may arise. Grant safe travel to all who may be returning from holiday visits or who may be on their way for a New Year's celebration. O oh, great physician, we lift up to you our prayers for those whose health has failed, for those facing surgery, for those recovering from injuries or surgery, and for those undergoing therapies or treatments in the quest to regain their health, comfort and strengthen them. Blessed Lord, who wept at the grave of your friend Lazarus and who shared the sorrow of his sisters Martha and Mary, we know you care for those who are grieving. Embrace them in your love and grant them your precious gifts of a peace this world cannot give and the hope that is ours through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh God, hear our prayers for those who were caught in the paths of the destructive tornadoes and flooding in the midsection of our country before Christmas. We remember, too, those who must contend with the winter storms that disrupt power, that cause accidents, and pose even greater hardships on the homeless and poor. Hear our prayers for the addicted and the temptations as they are greater at this season. Hear our prayers for military personnel and their families who mark still another holiday separated from loved ones and who anxiously long to be reunited. Hear our prayers for the hungry. Hear our prayers for those who are depressed, who have borne many disappointments in 2015 and who have little hope of things changing for them in 2016. Bless them. Hear our prayers for those who experience distress and turmoil in their homes, for those who know the pain of strained or broken relationships amongst family members. Hear our prayers for those who languish in prisons. Hear our prayers for the lonely. We pray for peace in our world, and we long for the senseless acts of violence to end. We pray for those who protect and serve us, asking you to guard them. And we pray as Jesus taught us to do for our enemies, asking you to help us to love them. All these prayers and the silent ones of our hearts, we offer in the name of Jesus Christ. And together we pray the family prayer he taught, singing. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Our scripture lesson today comes to us first from the 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, reading verse 12 through 20a. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have died. And then turning to Galatians chapter 4, reading verse 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. At the last meeting of this calendar year's old, odd month, Odd Monday Book Discussion Club, we discuss Carlo DeVito's book, Inventing Scrooge. This book examined the influences upon Charles Dickens and how he came to write the classic, A Christmas Carol. I admitted to the group that I love Christmas books and often buy one or several titles that capture my interest each year. One of the women there admitted that the Christmas season is so busy that she doesn't have the luxury to read then as she does during other parts of the year. So consequently, she reads none or few Christmas titles. I often choose more books than I know I will get to read during the Christmas season. Truth be told, if I want to read a Christmas book, then I too need to do it in November, or in January, because December is just too busy. That is, unless one runs across a small volume like I picked up this year that I purchased a year or so ago. The title is The Greatest Gift, a Christmas tale by Philip Van Doren Stern. Far from being a new release, it was actually first printed 71 years ago. I would like to read an excerpt from the book. Listen. The little town straggling up the hill was bright with colored Christmas lights, but George Pratt did not see them. He was leaning over the railing of the iron bridge, staring down moodily at the black water. The current eddied and swirled like liquid glass, and occasionally a bit of ice detached from the shore would go gliding downstream to be swallowed up in the shadows under the bridge. The water looked paralyzingly cold. George wondered how long a man could stay alive in it. The glassy blackness had a strange hypnotic effect on him. He leaned still farther over the railing. I wouldn't do that if I were you, a quiet voice 
beside him said, George turned resentfully to a little old man he had never seen before. He was stout, well past middle age, and his round cheeks were pink in the winter air as though he had just been shaved. Wouldn't do what? asked George sullenly. What you were thinking of doing? How do you know what I was thinking? Oh, we make it our business to know a lot of things, the stranger said easily. So begins the greatest gift. Does it have a familiar ring to it? Well, in a more familiar version, in the opening scene, two voices are heard in dialogue amidst the stars. The man is not named George Pratt, but George Bailey. The strange visitor is the more, in the more familiar version is known as Clarence, a second-class angel. And in that second version, George is despondent and seemingly at the end of his rope, too. He utters those memorable words, I wish I'd never been born. You see, the more familiar version is the great film, It's a Wonderful Life. That film was directed by the legendary director, Frank Capra. And the greatest gift was the small novella of 30 pages that served as the inspiration for that great movie. You will recall that by being given the special opportunity to see what the world would be like if he had never been born, George comes to realize that he had made a difference in people's lives, many people's lives, including the pharmacist, Mr. Gower, his brother, Harry, his classmate, Violet, his wife, Mary, and their children, Mr. Martini, and all the customers of the Bailey Building and Loan, as well as so many residents of Bedford Falls. As I read that story, suddenly I was gripped by the idea. What if Christ had never been born? And I wondered how different our world would be. And so began my exploration. If Christ had never been born, Joseph and Mary would have married earlier, and her, rather, their firstborn son would most likely not have been named Jesus, as no angel would have told them to give a son that name. If Christ had never been born, no good news of great joy would have been announced by an angel to shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. It would have been a truly silent night. If Christ had never been born, no star would have appeared in the sky to attract the attention of wise men or magi and drawn them to make a long, arduous journey to Bethlehem. There would have been no new king of the Jews. If Christ had never been born, John the Baptist would have had at least one less cousin and would not have pointed to a person declaring him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If Christ had never been born, a certain paralytic would have remained lame even if he had four good friends. A woman with a hemorrhage would have continued to suffer Ten men would have remained ostracized from their families and tormented by leprosy. Blind and deaf persons would continue to see and hear nothing. And a little girl and a man named Lazarus would not have been resuscitated so that they might enjoy some more years of life. If Christ had never been born, two rather than three crosses would have stood on Golgotha that Friday. 
but a repentant thief would not have gazed into the eyes of the righteous one who could assure him that he would be with him in paradise that very day. If Christ had never been born, would you and I have ever learned that it is more blessed to give than to receive? That the greater love is one that no one lays down one's life for one's friends. There's no greater love than that, that one lay down one's life for one's friends. And that we are not to worry about tomorrow, for today's troubles are enough for today. If Christ had never been born, Saul of Tarsus would have remained a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and regarding the law of Pharisee, he would not have become a persecutor of the church because there would have been no church. If Christ had never been born, Saul would have had no occasion or reason for writing. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Unless we were Jewish, we would be unaware of our sins and our need for forgiveness. If Christ had never been born and you were born of a Jewish woman, then you would at least be a member of the chosen people, still governed by the law and looking for the Messiah. Otherwise, we would have grown up in a pagan culture worshiping idols created by human hands and made of stone, wood, or metal. If Christ had never been born, there might be some random acts of kindness, but let's face it, we would be more inclined to selfishness than to sharing. We would hold grudges and look for opportunities to get our revenge if Christ had never been born, there would not have been a temporary truce between enemies on December the 25th, 1914, as together they sang Christmas carols from the trenches and crossed no man's land to exchange Christmas gifts. If Christ had never been born, there would be no reason for lighting an Advent wreath there would be no Christmas trees. There would be no Christmas carols. There would be no Christmas presents. And I could go on and on. While we may look upon some of those things as the trappings of Christmas, we long ago incorporated them into our traditions to pay homage to Christ, and to celebrate his birth, they are very important to us. But if Christ had never been born, we would not be doing any of them. The truth is, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And having died, he must have first been born and lived. Jesus was born in that stable in Bethlehem and he died on the cross in Jerusalem for the sins of the entire world years ago. His body was buried in a tomb and three days later, God raised him from the dead to new life. Between that Easter day and his ascension to heaven, the risen Christ appeared to so many people. Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, addressed the Corinthians and wrote, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, 
Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. Also to his Jewish and Gentile audience of Christians in Galatia, the Apostle Paul wrote these words. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. Being adopted as God's children, we also become heirs of our Heavenly Father. We are the recipients of God's grace daily and are heirs of heaven. In The Greatest Gift, as well as It's a Wonderful Life, George comes to the realization that he has been given the greatest gift, life. And after having made all those visits, seeing what it was like if he had never been born, he wants his life back. He was sorry. He was ready to give up on life with all of its problems and struggles. He sorely regretted wishing that he had never been born. He became aware of the good things he had done and how his life had mattered. Throughout the experience of seeing what the world would be like if George had never been born, he is transformed and gains a new and greater appreciation of life. To some degree, I suppose we can all put ourselves in George's shoes to review our lives from the perspective of our never having been born and seeing how the world would be different. Reviewing our lives from the perspective of never having been born and seeing how the world would be different seem to be the personal task each of us need to do in response to this sermon. The corporate task for us as a church is to consider what our world would be like if Christ had never been born. While our world is far from perfect, we would readily admit that our world is infinitely better because Christ was born. As those who have responded to the grace of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, we see what a difference His birth, life, death, and resurrection have made on us individually and on the world. Our first response then as a church is to offer God our praise and gratitude. As those who have responded to the grace of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, and having seen what a difference His birth, life, death, and resurrection have made on the world, we are reminded that our work as His disciples on this earth is not done. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we participate in the transformation of the world as we show the love of Christ in word and deed to others. Like George, we may underestimate what we have done. Like George, we may also question even now the value of what we do. But miraculously, we may discover even now that we are among the richest people in the world by having introduced people to Christ or having helped them draw closer to Christ who can transform their lives as surely as Christ has transformed our lives. Truly, we are blessed to have received the greatest gift when God gave us His Son. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today is the Apostles' Creed. I would invite you, if you're physically able, to stand and let us affirm what we believe. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Have you ever wondered what if Christ had never been born? In the world that we live in, I can't imagine what it would have been like if Christ had never been born. But because he was born long ago, because he died on the cross for our sins, we receive forgiveness of our sins and have new life in his name. And we are now charged with the good and glorious news to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ with others, to tell them what a difference he has made in your life and the difference you have seen that Christ has made in our world. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and evermore. Amen.